Today's episode of the BS Podcast is brought to you by SeatGeek, our presenting sponsor and the only fan-friendly app for buying and selling sports and music tickets. Other sites went back to the same old tactic of showing you a lower price and then charging you huge fees at checkout. At SeatGeek, the price you see is always the price you pay. So drop your old site, experience buying and selling tickets the way it should be to start using SeatGeek. Download the free SeatGeek app or go to SeatGeek. Dot com. We love SeatGeek. Uh, today's episode is also brought to you by the Ringer Podcast Network because we got a lot going on. This is the last week at Channel 33 for The Watch and for Keeping It 1600, two of our most popular podcasts. We're spinning them off next week and putting them on their own feeds that you will be allowed to subscribe to for the whopping price of zero dollars. Um, so look out for that. Keeping it 1600 and the watch available on their own feed starting next week. And don't forget about the Ringer NBA show and the Ringer NFL show because that's coming too. And we are off. Yeah. Clear enough for you. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. uh, here with David Chang. Very excited what, to be what here. Is, what's your exact title? Famous chef, <laughs> renowned chef, celebrity chef. What do I call you? Well, let's start there. Uh, man, I work in restaurants. I don't know. I, the, the title celebrity chef or famous chef or anything like that is, it's like ridiculous. I, I, I agree. I, I don't even understand Renowned that. chef? How about four-time James Beard winner? Yeah, though. That's pretty good. That's like being the four-time MVP in the NBA or something. <laughs> it's pretty wild, right? Yeah. Um, I, I honestly don't think about it or I think I'll spin off the planet. Right. right. Cause yeah. you're like me, you were just this unassuming yeah, dude like, who all of a sudden good stuff started happening. You're like, I don't want to exactly, jinx this. Exactly. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, I, I'm sure people th would say that I've changed. I'm sure that I have changed, but I try my best to sort of just keep it as normal as possible and be as paranoid as possible. Can I ask you the dumbest question I'm going to ask you this whole podcast? Shoot. Can only one person win the James Beard award? Um, there was a tie, actually. Okay. Uh, we, I won one of the awards with a tie. Um, so, yes, usually you can have nominations. You can have, like, a group. Okay. You know? Um, but usually it's one person, yes. And when you won the first one, what year was that? I think it was, like, 2007 or eight. Did you expect to win? No, I didn't. Did you freak out? Yes. It's like winning the Oscar, right? Uh, it was for Rising Star Chef. I think I was 29. And I remember the night before the award ceremony was still in New York. And I actually had to go for a walk. And, and it sort of hit on me that, like, hit me that, oh, my gosh. I If I win, I actually have to prepare a speech. Yeah. And public speaking and general speaking to other people is one reason why I became a cook so <laughs> right. the, the <laughs> prospect of talking to people about award speech was, was terrifying and i couldn't tell you what the hell i said yeah yes you're like one of those actresses that wins and just starts thinking the cast and crew and babbling and yeah we actually were nominated for outstanding restaurant for the second year we lost to Alinea in chicago one of the great restaurants in the world and and uh i was uh really nervous i was playing it cool one of our other chefs at sambar was nominated for the same award that i won rising star chef Matthew Rudolfker and I was giving him shit the entire night telling him how embarrassing he was going to be if he won all this shit and uh, about two categories before they announced us my heart started to right. pound through my chest and you sort of I had a mixed feeling of not wanting to win and also being like well sort of would like to win as well but the not wanting to win was sheerly out of fear of going on stage. <laughs> I remember the first time 30 for 30 was for an Emmy. It was the same thing. It was, it was like, oh, if, if, if we win, we have to go up. And, and, and then it, you, you're right. It's like you Jedi mind trick yourself. Like, it's actually, no, I don't need it. I'd rather not go up than. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's weird. It's a weird thing. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. And um, I don't know. It's a terrifying thing. So. so did you know immediately your life was different from the standpoint of, well, now people are going to want to get into my place constantly all the time no i mean when i opened up noodle bar uh in 2004 um we almost went out of business the first few months uh, first eight months almost and you were like living in some terrible in, apartment yes, right and just there seven street, days a week infested yeah i'm only recently this is the first time i'm now on the sixth floor of new york it's the first time in my life at the age of 38 i have sunlight 
<laughs> right. <laughs> um, but we almost, uh, I always lived on the ground floor or facing the, uh, another building. Yeah. Um, but winning awards, it was really hard for me to win awards because um, all these great honors were coming our way. Um, and there were the same honors a lot of the people that I worked for or other chefs that I admired. You know, no one says they want them, but um, one of the first awards um, I ever won, I declined it. I tried to decline it. Really? <laughs> yeah. Which award was that? Um, if you ask Dana Cowan at Food and Wine, um, she, I got a call and they asked, uh, she was Dana, and she's like, hey, David, would like you to know that we've selected you as like 2006 Food and Wine Best New Chef, which is still uh, a huge honor, one of the biggest yeah. honors. And I, I grew up wa reading this magazine thinking that th I will never, ever win this award. That's ridiculous. And I had worked for a lot of chefs that really wanted that honor, and I asked her, like, please, can I uh, work some more so I feel like I've earned this award? And uh, can I kindly decline? I'm not trying to be a jerk here. And that was just the state of mind I was in. I just didn't feel like I deserved anything, any recognition whatsoever. I was just trying to like stay in business. And then Dana, who's become like one of my moms in New York, was like, in my 20 years, no one's ever declined this award. We're not gonna start now. <laughs> right. And uh, that was really the first award. And um, What's more know. important, award? I mean, I would, I would imagine for most people, and definitely probably you, it's probably the respect from the other chefs, right? When, the, when people you really respected start reaching out to you and saying they like your stuff or whatever. Well, you know, we were really more of an upstart, and we didn't really get a lot of respect. And I think probably a lot of people in the business still don't respect us too much. Even after yeah. some of the other stuff you've done? Yeah, well, that's my mindset. It's like we're, we, gotta, we, we constantly have to prove people wrong. Because like, we're not your traditional restaurant group. We yeah. don't have the trappings of a lot of things and you know we play to our strengths and uh you know we're more like the bad news bears than anything else this sounds like you're just keeping a chip on your shoulder just because you need the some chip. massive chips yeah. on my shoulder yeah, absolutely <laughs> but uh that is that is like awards are wonderful i think they're i've always looked at them not as singular achievements but as team awards and uh, at the end of the day because food and what we do is so in the moment and ephemeral you don't need awards. Right. And if anything, sometimes it can fuck you because people's expectations are like, well, this isn't the best restaurant I've ever read about in my life. Yeah, live up to the hype. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I was reading the New Yorker piece about you from like seven, eight years ago, which I know it's really super weird to be written about. I'm sure you have <laughs> different issues with Another that. Another thing but I declined. That's a pretty flattering piece, though. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I, was, uh, I sounded like an idiot. I curse. I broke the record nah, in New Yorker. Fine. It was for fine. cursing. Um, but I thought it was. So you do noodle bar and you're trying to do it traditionally. Mm -hmm. And at some point you decided, let's just start fucking around. Let's start creating dishes that we like. Let's create the, let's start trying to do the traditional way of doing this and let's make awesome dishes that we would eat and take some chances. And that's, and at least what the article made it seem was that one, that's when it took off. Yes. That was when we almost went out of business and I viewed it very much like, um, being diagnosed with cancer or a terminal illness because nobody's coming to your restaurant. No one's coming to your restaurant. And uh, it was very much the mindset. If we're going to go out of business, let's fucking go big. <laughs> let's just go out swinging. So like, give me an example of a dish you made that is like, wow, we shouldn't do this now. Nah, fuck it. Let's do it. It wasn't necessarily the dishes that we made. I think, uh, I think it coincided with spring coming in Yeah, and we were like all of a sudden with me, I mean, we're, we don't have the bounty of LA and, uh, we started cooking more. We started to be a little bit more uh, emboldened to do things we might not normally do. And it was like the construct of a normal noodle bar. We st we yeah. stopped cooking dumplings. We started, you know, just creating new dishes, I would say. But it wasn't, I think, the dishes. It was more the attitude. It was really uh, don't tell us what to do. It was, it was an exploration of the customer is not always right. Right. And if we don't like you, we're going to tell you to leave or we'll tell you it was a brief period even though a lot of people feel that we still do it this way uh obnoxious stance of no substitutions no special requests and we were six that's it that was it and uh, it pissed a lot of people off and uh 
I, I, I was stuck between uh, what was a health food store where a lot of vegans and vegetarians were. And that first year was just constant battle. Um, not just first year, still feels this is a constant battle in different ways, but that first year, two years, I mean, we had the Environmental Protection Agency against us for uh, pork smells. We had uh, the city against us for electricity and water. Uh, we never had enough electricity for heat in the winter or air conditioning in the summer. Um, and it was just a constant battle. Like felt like everyone was against us. And it just actually didn't feel that way. It was. And customers would come in complaining that they couldn't get the food that they wanted. We were threatened with a lawsuit by a, a vegetarian who proclaimed that they got, <laughs> oh God. Um, you know, meat broth, even though we don't make vegetarian broth. So it it, it is it sort of become lore, but it actually happened. We just one day said, basically, fuck you to everyone. Um, we're not, we're going to put pork in everything. We're going to, even though that wasn't true, even though we had vegetarian dishes, we just took a stance and we were going to do something that no, I didn't think it was going to be a pivotal moment. But it wound up being something. It where sounds like, like you were inspired by the soup Nazi episode, <laughs> sort of a little bit. Uh, not 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 necessarily soup <laughs> Nazi, but we sort of became that. And yeah. we were young, and we ha had no idea what was going on. Uh, it, it's crazy to think that it was twelve to almost thirteen years ago now. Yeah. Um, but uh, when did you open the restaurant in DC? We opened the restaurant in DC uh, earlier this year in 2015 so November 2015 what was the one Joe house eats at that that's <laughs> Joe, been there that's for a the while one. I heard the podcast so I don't remember exactly when he came in yeah but he mentioned a, a, a outburst by me which most likely happened <laughs> I've been really working on trying to be better and a little bit more adult mature I think, it, I think it's good for your <laughs> I think it's good for your persona my talent uh, is really getting angry and uh, uh, I can't really say who but there's a famous coach who I sort of met this year and he said uh, I also have the gift of anger and you should really <laughs> use it to your advantage <laughs> and that was very frightening but uh, how many restaurants are you up to now um, I it's think double we, figures yeah it's, it's like figures. 13 14 15 something yeah, like and, that. and with the bakeries and and um, you know I don't really think of it that way I think of the people that we have I I honestly believe I run a sports team in my, my, my mind. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So you're like a league and you're just adding franchises or, or is or it more like, like an actual or like a team sort of. So each restaurant's like a, like a player. Yeah. Or, or each restaurant is sort of like a player, but you know, each restaurant is its own team. I guess you're right. But I look at it as sort of the single entity, um, in terms of how we run it. So, uh, I live in a world of sports analogies, which is why I always listen to everything yeah, yeah. you do. And it sort of gets me through the sort of crappy parts of, of running a business uh, because um, I don't think I'll ever have the money to own the Redskins or a football team or a basketball team. So uh, I think there are a lot of similarities between running a successful sports franchise and, and running a successful business. And there's also similarities between chefs and athletes, right? There are, I think, quite a bit. So these are... Go, wait, go into some of them. Because <laughs> now you're talking my language. So I think that the, the, I study a lot of chefs over the years, and I think that the sweet spot for a chef is age 27 to 32, which is How quite How come? Because you have the most stamina? It's a very physical thing, right? And it's a weird discipline. You have to be physically active and, and healthy enough to do a lot of activity. On your feet, bending down. People don't realize how sort of physical it actually is. Hmm. And mentally draining as well. Um, you know, it's a it's really physical hand labor and it's tough, but there's also at times creative elements. And I think this is where some people can get carried off being an artist or it's really a mixture of being an artist and a craftsman. And you can sort of veer towards one or the other. But in terms of being the best at it, I think that there is a peak for a, a chef to be in their prime, much like any athlete and uh, or yeah. And I've always felt that it was around 27, 32, where you have enough information and just enough know-how where you think you can make something, but you don't really know enough to actually know. So there's a curiosity. Correct. And then when does that curiosity kind of start to when dip? When you start to know too much. Yeah. Yeah. I really th think that it's a, you know, wisdom and accumulation of that is good for making sort of decisions. I think that I've, something I've always... Uh, tried to understand is when do you get worse at something 
And I think the only profession that you actually get better as you get older are things that are humanities driven, like being a judge or a lawyer or a historian. But anything else, I think that uh, you just get worse after a while in terms of creativity, right? Right. And I really wanted to be in the moment. And when I tell people, when I signed the lease for Noodle Bar in 2004, I didn't think I was going to be alive after the age of 35, which sounds crazy, but it was no different. Like, man, I don't think I'll be alive when I'm 60. I, right now, if you think, I, I don't think I'll be alive past the age of 60, right. right? But it was way more like determined at the age of 26 when I opened up Noodle Bar that I wasn't going to be alive past the age of 35. So it was like so this urgency. crazy sense of urgency. Let's just do it and everything that we did. And what about how much does criticism have to play in that? Like if you read the wrong review or you get the wrong take and you get in your own head with there some things lot, you want yeah. to do creatively. <laughs> there are a lot of things that happen on the, on the, on the criticism. And no, no different. Like I read uh, what, what you spoke to Draymond about when you criticized his ability to hit field goals, right? Right. It was like well, 23%. writers deal with the same thing. Like right. writers get picked apart all the time by other writers. And it was funny when I watched Kobe say, you know, talking about the the media and how it sort of can be good and bad thing for NBA players. Yeah. I think it's, it's absolutely true for restaurants and and the chefs that work in those restaurants. So um, we came at the age right when food blogging started to happen. Right. And people felt more emboldened to tell their opinions. So and I most rem- of them probably didn't had little idea what the hell they were talking about. I'm guessing. Yeah, but I can actually crazily remember almost everyone that said something negative, and right. Um, that's when I turn into a crazy person. And there's like probably like a tiny sliver of each thing you hear that's like, yeah, mm. well maybe there's something <laughs> to that. I mean, one. I'm selectively competitive by nature. Yeah. I am a pretty lazy guy, but um, when someone like like threatens or I believe like uh, says something that I have, I almost have to interpret it even if it's not a bad thing as a negative thing yeah. to like push me to be better and the people around me to be better. Well, you probably need that. Cause I think one thing that happens with chefs once they hit a certain level of success is they can go down that route of more restaurants and here's a franchise here. And then, when, and then all of a sudden you have all these places, you're not cooking in any of them. Yep. You're putting your, you're putting your name and your fate in the hands of all these people that aren't you. Yeah. So being a, being a chef is, is interesting because it is a lot like being an athlete. Like, um, if you're a really good cook, right. It's like being an amazing player on the yeah. team, but really good player not every player is well-rounded. Some people are only good at one thing, and it's very true with cooks. And a lot of kitchens are system-driven. So, it, it, you know, just like athletes, you know, uh, you could be really good on one team, but if you transfer to another team, you're not going to be as good because of the system. Evan uh, Turner. Perfect example. He's going to be good on, like, three teams, and he found one of the three last season. And I always use the Derek Coleman example for cooks, right? Um very, I, by the way, I'm just going to interrupt you. I can't wait for this. <laughs> I love Derek Coleman. Like, Derek this Coleman, is be without great. a doubt, is one of the most physically gifted athletes to, be- ever, to ever ever play. Best power forward <laughs> on paper of all ever, time. Ever. But was, uh, you know, just couldn't ever put it mentally together. Never yeah. had the coaching or the desire to be. Because he was so gifted. You know, if he was half as physically gifted, I think he would have been, you know, uh, much more better player. He would have been one of the 25 best players ever. <laughs> but he was just too talented. He could post up and shoot threes and he was lefty and he could pass and there wasn't one thing he could do. So that's 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 the thing. It's like so, you see some cooks that are so talented that they don't know how um, to empathize or communicate to anyone else why anyone else isn't as good as them. And it's, you see this with athletes all the time. They're just too fucking good. And I see cooks that are naturally gifted. 100%, but I think that they're never the cooks that actually make great chefs. And being a chef is way different, right? Um, you, can tur- you can turn yourself into a very good cook through just, you know, hitting the gym, basically. Yeah. Practicing, practicing, and um, it's, it's, it's all, many of the same attributes. It's, it's um, very similar. And, and if you're a really good cook, it doesn't always translate that you're going to be a great coach, basically. And a chef is now a coach, more well, or you, less. You worked for Daniel Balud. I did. 
that how you say his name? Danielle Balud. And yeah, yeah. John George. From, and from Cafe Balud. Yep. Which um, my friend William Goldman. Yeah, he loves who fried lives chicken. right there. Yeah. And every time I see him, we go to that restaurant because he loves that restaurant. And that's his favorite. And he's convinced the guy's a genius. And how, how old were you when you were working for him? Uh, I was 24. And we worked for Andrew Carmelini. And he used to come in and craft a lot. And he's a real gourmand. And uh, is that that's obviously a good thing for you to have had the chance to work under people oh, who yeah, are like I mean, borderline geniuses. Yeah, you you it's it's a it's a lot like having great coaches, right? Yeah, and, and learning systems, and that's why like I think Popovich is amazing. I yeah. think Belichick is amazing, even though people hate him. It's like the dude wins all the time, and there's systems and there's discipline, and you learn how to. If you work under the great chefs you learn how to work your ass off. Right. And, and you realize that talent will only get you so far. And uh, it's cooking in a really good kitchen is almost 90% organization and cleaning. You don't really cook. It's right. 10% cooking. And uh, that's absolutely the truth. So if you're working in a place where it's not organized, it's never really going to work out inconsistently. You can be like, like a really good team in sports if they're, you know, they can be good every once in a while, right? If they're not disciplined. But so I always like, felt, I always felt like chefs were like great drummers in a band, where I don't understand how you do it after like fifteen years. Like I watch drummers, you see these guys, these bands that have been around for twenty five, thirty years, and it's like, how does that guy just drum for three hours a night, one hundred and ninety times a year? And they all end up with back problems and different yeah. things and special seats. And I would imagine physically but, but, for chefs, it's similar, yeah, right? One hundred percent. And it's really hard because there are no days off. There are no off seasons. Yeah. Um, it's it's. Um, I, I I question that. I think a lot of my friends now, as they get older, myself included, it's like no one ever told us what baggage was going to happen, and. Um, I think this is the first time you have a generation of American staff that were very successful that are in their late 50s, mid 60s now that are still like just figuring out what the next step is. I mean, and you got to that point a little bit earlier. I mean, you're, I was very you're already lucky. like sniffing around, branching out. You ready to think for GQ? <laughs> you're, you but know. I because I, I, I wanted to age gracefully. Yeah, you know, I I. I I've always looked what other chefs do, and I don't want to be that guy that was like I can still play the game. And I think mentally I can still do what I did when I was in my early 20s. Right. But there's no fucking way. I see cooks that we have at like Co, for instance, and they're like 20 years old. They're, they just have a physical stamina that I just don't have anymore. Right. And besides, like life happens, right? Yeah. And I put off life for a long time and then it eventually just catches up with you. So. Pussy of the Redskins, they're taking years <laughs> off your life. <laughs> I'm a Raiders fan right now. <laughs> did it when you did the thing? The uh, what was it? Kickstarter. You were like, yeah. hey, and you got a lot of attention for that. It was awesome. I didn't I ended know up using was... you in one of my columns. <laughs> I had that no idea. I had no idea it was going to be that way. But I was born and raised a Redskins fan, and and uh, I'm so pissed that Dan Snyder bought the Redskins. And I wish like the Lerner family bought him or the Cook family kept him in the in the family. So um, he's going to outlive you and house. And the sad thing team. is he's going to give it to his kids. And yeah, we're going to be sliders. like, the, you know, we're going to be like the Clippers. Like I didn't think that growing up, you, you, you read about the Clippers and what a shitty organization it is. And yeah, you're like, oh, my God, I feel so bad for them. And I realize now that's how the rest of the NFL use the Redskins. <laughs> so if he came into your restaurant I mean, I'm do sure. Do you cook your best meal for him, or do you do you make him leave? What happens? Young Dave Chang would probably have kicked him out. One hundred percent. Older Dave Chang older just, Dave just Chang, spits I, in his I, food. I don't know. I, I mean, that's the thing. Is like, don't come into his restaurant, Daniel Snyder. I don't think he's going to come in. Yeah, but I'm idea. pretty sure he's not. You're a pretty a, vocal critic. He's terrible. Although you know they got a good GM in right now, but I mean, there's nothing worse than being a Redskins fan and talking about the Redskins. Yeah. I mean, we're just pathetic. It's reached that point. It's just the Redskins. But I mean, this year they made a couple of big moves. Got Josh Norman. Yeah, but that was terrible. Cousins. That was, I mean, at least when you look at the Eagles, they look like the Redskins of like 10 years ago. And now the Browns are like the Redskins too. Sort of. Yeah. So You see a just, bunch of just bad losers that yeah. are in your yeah. loser club. I mean, all your teams are fantastic to root for. I know. Knock on wood. <laughs> right there. It's been a good run. I, I, it's probably ending soon. So I've, I've, 
I've I've enjoyed it. I've had it both ways. It's much more fun when your teams are good. I mean, it's much more fun when your teams are well run. Yeah, I mean, I I fucking love the Patriots. I just think they're like they're very well run. That's the thing. The older I get, and the more I look at sports, I just really think it it almost entirely comes down to who owns and runs your team, and whether you got lucky with a couple moments. Like, did you win the Carl Towns lottery? <laughs> you know, like if if Philly wins the Carl Towns lottery, Hinky's still there and his plan worked. And it's like we got Carl Towns. This is great. Sam Hickey knew what he was doing. You think and he's gonna get another he's, job? No, done. I, I think he'll get another like assistant GM type job. I don't. I don't think the sabermetric thing is. It's been a rough year for the sabermetric thing. Nate Silver was wrong on Trump, and Hinky fell apart. Daryl Morey, and the Rockets. Yeah. It's been tough. How much do you Ooh. love Tom Brady? Like you compared love? to who? Like my children? No, not like that. Like my, like do you, is he like your one of your favorite athletes? Do you? I love him more than one of my two dogs. <laughs> but I also think I love you more than one of my oh, two good, dogs, good, Olivia. Good, good. Olivia, the rescue dog. I did, my need to trade her. Uh, Brady's been an unbelievable. I, I we've been lucky. We had Orr, which was I. I was really young when we had Bobby Orr. I wasn't alive for Ted Williams, obviously. And then you have Larry Bird. And you get Tom Brady. It's like you get one of those as a city and you're happy. And I mean, I don't know if I'd ever want to hang out with Tom Brady because of his like weird eating habits. And But well, he wouldn't eat your food. No, no, There's no. no. He's like a vegetarian now or something like that. He's, but like, yeah, he would ask I you just love time. rooting for the guy because like, man, like things didn't necessarily go his way to get to where he got to. So, yeah, he's a like, chip on the shoulder guy. Yeah, he but, remembers everyone who got drafted ahead of yes. him in the 2000 draft, the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there, there's something to be said, which is why I think I root for Tom Brady so much. I think uh, and Draymond, it's another love chip Draymond. on the shoulder yeah, guy. That, yes, I love, I love that whole story. So I definitely uh, can um, empathize and root for athletes that are traditionally overlooked or the underdogs. <laughs> I'm sure that uh, I project myself on these guys quite a bit. So, what's your best? An athlete came into my restaurant and blank happened story. Oh my god. I won't say who. Okay. On the, we're in Toronto, but there's a very good player on the Raptors that loves eating our milk bar products, and I'm always like, "Hey, man, like, <laughs> you, you, you shouldn't uh, should do this in moderation. Be careful. <laughs> Be careful. Yeah. Not careful. Not careful. I haven't seen him in a while. I haven't heard that he's been in there a while. But uh, in terms of athletes, though, the patron saint of Momofuku is John McEnroe. Like, oh, he's yeah. the best. He's I the spent like best. five hours with him in October, and it was the best. Um, John McEnroe is the best. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what a great guy. I, I just. I wish he. I, I mean, I love my dad, but if I had to hire an actor to play my dad, if my dad got kidnapped or something, I would hire John McEnroe. Well, no, I just love John McEnroe. Like. I just love John McEnroe. And growing up, I, I never even really understood tennis, but I was like, this is unbelievable that my mom is yelling at me for not having a temper tantrum, but. This guy is well. That's what you res- he resonated yeah. as a tortured genius, and he was just refused to accept losing. And while he was gifted at the net, he wasn't this, you know, Rafa Nadal like person. He was right. just genuine. I'm a lunatic, and I want to win more than anyone else. It was great, and he uh, made tennis interesting. I I got a great John Mayer story too. I got a lot of them, but he, he there. One day, I uh, I actually wound up at his father's office. Because he called me and I thought I got in trouble. Successful dude, his father. Yeah, lawyer. And I thought John McEnroe left a message. I was like, oh shit. Because I had a huge John McEnroe Nike poster. Yeah, I remember that one. And um, man, like one thing led to another. And basically he just wanted me to clean his office. And I got all the John McEnroe paraphernalia. And uh, it was pretty wild actually. He had, uh, (laughs) it was was a funny day. And he gave me a lot of cool one-offs. Uh, that you know, he you know what was interesting about his dad. This is what I, I love the most about him. He, he's like, well, I know you love my son, but you should really root for Patrick too. I was oh, like, I like that. That's pretty cool. That's a good dad. Yeah. Good dad. I remember I I was in on McEnroe from day one. I was like eight or nine when he started when he made his first U.S. Open run. I think that was like seventy seven, and they used to show his dad a lot with the the fist pumps, and his dad looked like a old Massachusetts senator or something. <laughs> like he just had a had a really cool vibe to him. All right, I'm going to fire questions at you. I don't normally do this with with the pod. Um, usually we go more linear, but I have so many things I want to talk This is like so about. intense. I didn't expect it to be this I know, intense. I like, it's like Bill I fucking know. Simmons, and this is really crazy. Um, 
Why are restaurants a bad investment in 40 seconds? Um, oh my God. Yeah, 40 seconds, 39, 38. Gonna, I always tell people if you're gonna invest in a restaurant, throw a dinner party, get all your investors there, and bring all the cash, and then burn it all. Because that's exactly what's gonna happen. And the person that's going to win is the person that's like, if that's what it takes for me to get my restaurant, then that's what I'll do. It's that fucking insanity that you wanna see. Right. You have to be off your rocker. But if you're not that crazy and dedicated to it, you're most likely gonna fail. Would you rather, if somebody asked you, should I start, should I invest in a restaurant and be the backer for it, or should I invest in my cousin's record label? No. What would you pick? My God. <laughs> It's like, about my cousin's, it's like Donald Trump or something. My cousin's you know? sneaker business. <laughs> These are all... Uh, oh, my God. I can't. I, I, I pass. These are all, all right. bad, bad investments. Okay, good. Uh, what was the worst restaurant idea you were ever pitched? I mean, I think I made them myself. I did a <laughs> Korean burrito bar. It was called Sambar. Uh, <laughs> Korean burrito bar? Yeah. That sounds delicious. Yeah, no, I just was... Joe House just got hungry from 3,000 miles away. He doesn't even know what's happening. A Korean Chinese burrito bar. That was originally what Sambar was. Um, and it yeah. didn't work? Too weird? Too weird. Too weird. Too weird. Not weird enough for me. Yeah. What's in a Korean burrito? You have all... I think that you have everything that's analogous to, like, basically, like, a Mexican burrito place you have salsa you have kimchi you have rice you have the meat meats and you have the wraps which whether it be lettuce or you know everyone thinks of tortillas mexican but chinese have mandarin pancakes like flat pancakes too right. so i uh maybe i was yeah I, it made sense to me so <laughs> and it just and people weren't into it no but that led to because I, we had loans out to make this restaurant work um you know, turned into Sambar and we, we just opened from 12 to four in the morning every day. And that turned into, you know, a very successful enterprise that I would never want to go through ever again. <laughs> that sounds like ESPN story for how the, the ESPN phone led to watch ESPN. The ESPN phone was a terrible idea that lost them just shit loads of money, but the infrastructure they built from that actually helped them with other things. Yes. That was your version of that. Although you didn't lose a hundred million dollars. Um, who is Michelin and why do they matter so much? And why do I have to care that Michelin gave somebody a star? Where do they come from? So the Michelin guide is from the tire company and it was right. So how does a tire France. company get into restaurants? So they were trying to sell tires in France and in order to sell tires and to promote the sale of tires, they, because people travel in France, they put a guide of food together. And now these people are in control of every chef's destiny for whether not they have a great restaurant it's, or not? It's less important to you certain generation. Uh, but for me, still to this day, even though there's top 50 this and all this stuff, Michelin Guide is still super important. And even though it's glamorized in movies, all that shit is like not necessarily true in how it happens. But um, it's intensely difficult. And I think for, again, for guys like me, uh, it's still, even though it doesn't make sense why I care about it so much, I do. Do you know when the Michelin person's in? Do they no, keep no. it secret? It's hell on earth. Every, you know, I, oh my God, it makes me so mad that every September, you know, that feeling I was never a, a good student in school. And yeah. whenever report cards came out, I'd always be fearful that my Asian dad and mom would freak out because their son didn't get straight A's, but like C's and B's and maybe a couple D's. Yeah. And I'd always like, be fearful for report card time. And I never thought that at the age of 38, I'd still have that feeling every oh, September. God. It's like reviews are the worst, right? Um, and the Michelin Guide is so consistent on its dates. And you, you know, we have two Michelin stars for Co. And I've said this before, it's like great and terrible because, you know, we've had like two Michelin stars, which is amazing for like seven or eight years in a row. And we two's just, the best you can do, right? Three. You can get three? Yeah, three is like Who holy has fuck. three? There are, like I believe, four 150, oh. 58 or 150 restaurants in the world that have three Michelin stars. Really? Yeah. That many? Yeah. So so you have two for a bunch, but you don't have three for anything? Yeah. and, 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 and That's if, a chip on the shoulder if I've ever heard one. <laughs> if we get three, that's a problem. One day if we ever get three, if we're lucky enough because we worked hard enough to ever get three, the fear is like, well, now you're fucked because right. what there's if no you way lose? to live up to that. Yeah. What if you lose a star? <laughs> oh yeah. Right? 
So that's the fear. It's like the losing of the star is what drives chefs crazy. Some chefs have even like, you know, you know, there's a fair famous chef Bernard Wazo that committed suicide. There, 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 there are a couple reasons why that might not have happened the way it did. But, you know, the stress on a chef on the, on the acclaim that you need, you need to maintain is just like too much. So you're better off with two. So every once in a while, just fuck up a dish Yeah, just stay at two. (laughs) (laughs) Which is why a lot of chefs try to like reject the Michelin guide. So it's a, it's a level of stress that stress that is ultimately, I think, pretty unhealthy. A uh, quick break to talk about Casper. It is a sleep brand that created one perfect mattress that is sold directly to customers, eliminating your commission-driven inflated prices. It's an award-winning sleep surface developed in-house, sleek design, and it is delivered in a small, how did they do that size box. They've delivered these to my house. It's amazing. You actually, you don't know what it is and you open up and a mattress pops out. It's awesome. Mattresses can cost uh, over $1,500. Sometimes Casper mattresses cost $500 for a twin size mattress, $600 for a twin XL, $750 for a full, $850 for a queen, $950 for a king. It's completely risk free. Uh, they offer free delivery, free returns with a 100 night home trial. If you don't love it, they'll pick you up, pick up the mattress, and they will refund absolutely everything. It is an obsessively engineered mattress at a shockingly fair price. Time Magazine named it one of the best inventions of 2015. Made in America. Try Casper for 100 nights risk-free in your own home. If you don't love it, they'll pick it up and refund you everything. Hey, check this out. Casper.com slash BS. You get $50 toward any mattress purchase. Promo code BS. Terms and conditions apply. And since we're here, let's talk about the 5-4 Club. They mailed me some clothes. And they were really cool. I'm actually going to wear... I never have time to buy clothes anymore. I really like these. I'm going to wear a jacket that they sent tonight for dinner. It was great. It is super easy to join the 5-4 Club. It's an LA-based brand. It's $60 a month. Uh, the only way to get the brand is to be a member. If you want to stand out in the crowd and not blend in like everyone else, well, maybe you need 5-4 Club. Uh, they deliver the clothes to your door every month. It's a very easy sign-up process. Go in, personalize your style preferences, fill out your profile, um, and if you go to 5-4 Club and use promo code BS at sign up, you get 50% off your first package. They have shorts, they have jackets, they have jeans, they have button-up shirts, whatever you want. You can get $120 worth of clothing for $30 for your first month's package. Uh, check it out, 5-4 Club right now and thanks for the free clothes i really enjoyed them i'm gonna wear at least five of them tate you were jealous yeah tate's nodding he was jealous of my clothes all right back to david chang is there anything i can learn from internet ratings of restaurants that makes any coherent sense at all or is it just all bullshit you have to pick and choose right i mean like on sports blogs right how many of those bloggers actually know what they're talking about not many not many yeah and you yourself probably trust only five people in the sports media yeah if that if that yeah and that's pretty much the same in, in like food writing and food criticism there's only less than a handful that you really should trust who do you think is the best food or can you even say who do you think uh, is the which food critic I mean, L- slash writer do you trust the most in la la is blessed to have jonathan gold it's not even great I mean, I agree. I was hoping you'd say that, but I didn't know if he had insulted you in some way. No, I mean, if he did, like, that's another thing. Like, the guy just knows everything. I mean, fuck. He really does know everything. And his, what he promotes in LA is so cool because he promotes everything. And, um, you know, so I I think that LA is blessed and very lucky to have Jonathan Gold. LA is happening right now. Yeah. I mean, I know you know this, but. I moved here end of 2002, and for a variety of reasons, it's just become so much more interesting to be here. And even like when we started Grantland in uh, 2011, it was really hard to get people to move from New York to LA. And now people want to come here. I know. And it's things weird. are happening, and different parts of the city have taken off. And even since I've been here, like Silver Lake, Los Feliz took off. I would say Los Feliz. Los, how do you say it, Joe? Los Feliz? Los Feliz. I just can't get it in my head. I mispronounce <laughs> everything. Uh, East LA, 
all of a sudden stuff happened down there and like Venice, obviously. And it, Venice is crazy. Or everywhere. Downtown LA. Downtown so. LA started happening. Now it's like this whole sunset yeah. Hollywood we, we, area. Bill, we may or may not be coming to Los Angeles. Don't tempt me. Don't tease me. We'll see. Me. We'll see. But Seriously? Yeah. We've been looking at it. Really? Yeah. That'd be unbelievable. I know. I'd I, gain I'd like five pounds. <laughs> it's actually not. It would be bad for me <laughs> to be on TV. Um, Burnt with Bradley Cooper. Did you see this movie? Yes, I have seen that movie. Is and, this um, like the, like me seeing Draft Day and just going yes. crazy? Yes, one hundred percent. It's like watching Draft Day. A just little having, bit. A, oh my god, that would never happen. Yeah. No, like you're just like that for an hour and a half. Well, the thing that <laughs> there are a lot of things that wouldn't happen in that movie. Um, <laughs> it's sort of comical and it's sort of based on Gordon Ramsay's life. And people don't realize that before Gordon Ramsay became this TV celebrity, he was without a doubt a very serious, very serious awesome chef and when i saw the clip of bradley cooper making um i believe is a sea bash dish with a the slices of zucchini i knew immediately oh that's a gordon ramsay dish this this movie is about gordon ramsay because of that dish in the commercial and so you think he was like a consultant for it no he actually was i think was a producer and uh uh, and uh obviously it was romanticized in hollywood and hollywood sort of just fucked it all up but uh it could have been way better but what they did get was the, the stress. They got that pretty good. And the te- had a couple of good temper tantrums. They in had there. a good couple of temper tantrums, and people were like, "My girlfriend was like, is that, you know, is that real?'" I was like, "No, it's not real." But no, it's like, it's, oh. we don't do that at all. But it's like pretty, pretty real. Yeah, <laughs> some of that was pretty real. And the intensity of it. Yeah, I mean. I'm a very competitive guy. So you're pro burnt. I feel like you're I'm see, not deep pro, down pro burnt. I love any you, cooking movie, even though yeah. I'm sure, I mean, even though it was like not great. Not the Zeta Jones one. You don't like that one. Oh, that, uh, what that was, was that one? No terrible. reservations. That was yeah, that was that, better. The Martha Martha one, the one that's based in uh, the German original, was much better. But uh, still, to this day, probably the best cooking movie out there is probably that fucking cartoon. Sorry, I'm cursing so much. Uh, no, it's all right. Ratatouille. It's- <laughs> Ratatouille, the best cooking movie. Yeah. My kids like that one. Yeah, yeah. I didn't mind Bert. I, I, I got to say, it, it kind of flew by. My wife likes Bradley Cooper. She was happy. I like the girl in it. Sienna Miller. Alicia, that's, that's no, that's the a, other one. Oh, which one? The one who was who ended up getting uh, winning the Oscar. Really? Alicia Vikander. Vikander. Oh, she was in that movie too. And she had like two scenes. Oh, you're right. She was that. She was drop dead. That's right. She was great. So I I I, uh, I I gave John Favreau a bunch of shit because like, dude, you have sex with <laughs> for his movie Chef. Oh, Chef, yeah, that that's one, another that one. one. I was like, man, yeah. you're really uh, you're really uh, mm. that was like, <laughs> I was really happy that Roy and everyone helped out. But to me, that was just funny. It's like he's having sex with Sofia Vargas. <laughs> And Scarlett Johansson. Yeah, like, a little unrealistic. Like, like, if you want people to join this industry, you're doing a really good job of <laughs> promoting it right now. Do you, what? What is it like for chefs with with the ladies? Because there is some sort of there's like a little power kind of thing going on. I remember I'm not going to name names, but when I lived uh, in a city that was in L.A., um, there was a chef that definitely had it going. Yeah, I mean. The girls were there, like hanging. There's a little bar hanging out after, and I mean, it's it's definitely a thing. The industry itself is pretty, like, can be pretty loose, right? Yeah. Uh, whether it's a chef and a server and stuff like that. I mean, I've really kept it clean over the years. Uh, Good answer. I have. Uh, I think I'm probably the only one. <laughs> I swear <laughs> to God, <laughs> not the only one, but like, it's amazing to see. Like you're never surprised when you hear it, right? Like, hey, yeah. I'm dating someone's like, is that the hostess? Yeah, which is totally like HR hot zone, but it happens more than you realize. Um, well, it is like it's everyone. But, I mean, I I worked in a restaurant and a bar for a couple of years, and you just get thrown together. It's almost like being in a battalion. It's, I view it as summer it, you camp. Get very close. You're yeah, stuck in summer, summer camp. camp's a great analogy, and I think it's fine as a cook. Because that's just happens. You're trying to carve out a social life from one to five in the morning every yeah. night, and it's a lot of fun. But I think it's I. This is where like I I, I turn into like a, a very boring like NFL coach. It's like you can't put yourself in a position where you're going to take or like, you know, I I, I feel sense. like it's really hard. Whether it's scheduling and it's something I've really tried to steer clear, and I try to encourage my own guys to like, you know, I can't I can't really even talk about it. I'm sure, but. Well, part of it is 
you know, you, you're on the same schedule and a lot of times you're getting done at 1130, 12 o'clock, 1230 at night. And everyone's like, oh, I need to do a little re And then that's when stuff starts happening. Yeah. And what's weird is cooking is, I think, cooler to people now. So, yeah, there are a lot more. Definitely people. true. So um, back in the day, it was just sweaty. Yeah. You just look at the chef. I mean, that guy's sweaty. That guy looks hot. I mean, I'm uh, I'm lucky that anyone has has uh, ever fancied me. So, uh, I I'm not. I feel like your traditional like uh, chef. I've I know the chefs that are there. Yeah. And um, it certainly has changed. I think the game has changed for a lot of people. Does it bother you that Vegas has so many great restaurants? You know, and everyone, but no regulars, basically. But you know what's cool about Vegas is. Because there are so many restaurants, there's an amazing culinary industry there. It's really like the culinary capital of the world, deep down. Uh, Everybody's there. You have a different. place there's there, a right? Huge, there, we, will, we will open in the Cosmo soon. Every relevant chef seems like they have a place there. It is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's tough to pass up because it's a lot of fun. I think it can be great for branding. And... Uh, there's a lot of people that work in the hospitality business there. So it's, 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 I think there's more solidarity there than most other cities, quite frankly. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. What else do I have on my list? Um, oh, were you ever in chef's table? No, no right? I wasn't in chef's table. Now you're sitting out because you chip on your shoulder. You didn't, you didn't get asked <laughs> no, in the I, first I, five. So I fuck actually, chef's table now. <laughs> I did a, so we did Lucky Peach, and that got repurposed as Mind of a Chef. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I would say life happened, and I wanted to figure out how to run the restaurants and not do TV. Um, I never wanted to necessarily do TV, but uh, now that we have options, I think that's something to pursue. But uh, we never did Chef's Table. We never did for future seasons of Mind of a Chef. We wound up running Lucky Peach with Peter Meehan, this, the, this magazine um but yeah so, we we talked we had grantland we we talked briefly about is there a possibility of collaborating yeah that was very that. very exciting yeah and i would have loved that um like everything else that happened when i was there it never came to fruition <laughs> <laughs> sorry i had to <laughs> but no i mean uh, we, we, i think we got something in the pipeline and we're excited about it so um although i i um I did some work for Chef's Table for our, the chef Alex Atala from Brazil. He's in the next season of Chef's Table, which is on Netflix. So, Postmates, your friend or your enemy? Man, friend. Okay. I love, uh, that's the one benefit of living in New York is you get everything delivered. So yeah. it's the fucking best. Okay. But not, does kind of ruin the whole experience of I'm going out to dinner. The yeah, but dish, like, the, do you still the, do you really love going out to dinner? I actually still do, but but when you have kids, um, you end up not going out to dinner almost all the time. But I still love. I think the experience of going to a nice dinner where there was real thought and care put into absolutely everything that's going on when it's done well, still going out to dinner. But I cook more at home now than ever before. And yeah. For years, as a cook, I never I would turn off my gas in my kitchens. Or I would st use it as storage, the oven, or refrigerator. Right. I, up until last year, I never had plates or even forks or knives in my, <laughs> my apartment. <laughs> but uh, I've been cooking a lot more at home. Um, so one of the the best dinner I've had in the last year. What's the place in D.C. that's super hot? The weird place that's Rose's Luxury. Yeah. So I it, went there with Kornheiser and Joe House. And Joe House had been there a bunch of times. So that's great. and then Kornheiser had never been there. Did you have a it good time? Was, we had such a good time, and he and they just kept feeding him, and he was complaining about it, but he couldn't stop eating. It was almost like watching when uh, when the garbage gets spilled over and the dogs eating the garbage and can't stop. So he mm. had that; he just couldn't stop, and it was just it yeah. was great, and it was a really unique meal, which is what I liked about it. You know, Aaron Silverman just won a James Beard Award for the Mid Atlantic Region as Best Outstanding Chef, and he won Food and Wine. He's having a killer year. Yeah, and he 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 used to work for me at Noodle Bar back in the day, and he worked at Hearth, and in retrospect, like. And this is no disrespect to Aaron. I, I'm so happy for his success, but he's a perfect example of a player that became a much better coach, way better coach. Because mm. as a cook, I, he would always ask all these questions. He was so curious. And 
it's almost like when you like see a, an athlete that maybe I think that'll be a really good coach one day and he is uh, he's kicking ass and I'm so happy for him and all the success he's just opened up a new restaurant called pineapple and pearls and um, I, I, I he's one of the few good guys out there so what's your favorite name you've come up with for a restaurant because naming things is are it's so hard Momofuku is a pretty good one. It's itself. pretty good. Uh, and people mangle that. I wasn't oh, even yeah. going to try to say it. Yeah. Uh, and I love that it's the name that keeps on giving. Momofuku yeah. means lucky peach. So we got the magazine from there. And uh, we, we we launched a fried chicken sandwich shop called Fuku from Momofuku. I was going to ask you about yeah. that. $8 spicy fried chicken. That's it, right? Nothing that's else on the menu? That's pretty much it. Pretty much it. It's, I, I, I uh, yeah. It's a, we have chicken tenders. We got a few well, other you, things. You do have other stuff in the yeah, menu. Yeah, there's like four things. I, I imagine it's like in and out. Meets. So where is it? Uh, they're mostly in, uh, in, <laughs> we have four locations. We have MSG, we have City Field, we have Midtown at Ma Pesh on 56th Street oh, between so 5th and 6th, and we have 10th Street, 1st Avenue, and we are going to open one downtown in the financial district pretty soon. Downtown New, New York. York. Yeah. Oh, God forbid any of these places were in L.A. Hey, we're, we're getting here. I promise you, we'll be here soon. I don't know when I can announce it, if I can ever announce it. Chen's like, no. <laughs> Our friend Chen is here. So you have basically four things in the menu. You can only pick from one of those four things. Well, there was a lot of off-the-menu stuff. I love In-N-Out. Okay. And I've always been an admirer of their ability to, to promote things off the menu. You can get, like... I think like 64 different combinations. And um, I think that's a very organic, natural way of So you people. like that? Yeah, I love it. Helps the, so now you know who the true regulars are when they come in. Man, Does the it, internet ruin that at all though? Nah, yeah, nah. but still people don't know. Like in, in and out I, I just told someone yesterday that you can get it spicy. Did you know you get it spicy at in and out No. You see? How, how, you have the internet and you don't know that. I have one of my, I, I'll fully admit I'm not right all the time. <laughs> a lot of people try to pretend they're right all the time and I'm not right all the time. And one of my worst opinions that I actually truly believe, I like five guys more than in and out. Wow. Yeah. And well, that, I think people you know, out here go crazy when they're like, what's your favorite? You like in and out? And I'm like, you know, I kind of like Bill, five guys more. The I reality is, is I, I genuinely liked you so much more before you just said that. I know. Five guys I is said. great too. But I as know. A, here's the thing. Five guys might have a better burger. But and be, definitely better French fries. Yeah. But In and Out, I think, is a more delicious product. Listen, I'm not defending it. I can't help where my heart <laughs> leads me. In my heart, <laughs> I drive by Five Guys and I get a whiff and I get excited. And they, I mean, it's basically just burgers. It's fine. The, it's LA delicious. has so many burger places now. I mean, the the whole burger renaissance is like beyond a renaissance. It's there. There's burger places everywhere. Fast food is like. At the apex here in Los Angeles. Like, you can get anything that's fast food. Well, and then there's fast food, but then there's, like, the kind of fancy fast food. And this is an area, like, as as chefs try to figure out how much money can they make from their restaurants. Really, like, you make those places where you get, like, the $15 burger. Isn't that, like, the best way to make money? Just crank those out? Well, the problem is it's, like... It's not as easy as it seems, <laughs> cranking stuff out. Yeah. You know, scaling a business is really difficult. Because it seems like people like you are now, yeah, while you're doing all the stuff you would do anyway, you're kind of intrigued by this 8 to $13 price range for things. Yeah. I, I mean, partly is uh, things are changing rapidly in the culinary landscape, particularly in New York. I can't really speak too much out of the country outside D.C., but um, one of my big – I'm a – I've always been an advocate for cooks and the culinary lifestyle and wanted to take care of them. And I think people assume that I make way more money than I actually do. Yeah. Um, I think that with labor changes happening, which I'm 100% for because I, again, I always want the cooks to make more money. Um, it's going to be really tough to figure out the next couple of years, how, uh, restaurants are going to stay in business. And I think that, um, one way of doing that is through systems and scale. And that's why you see even guys like myself trying to figure out a way that you can replicate something that's delicious and consistent. Um, and I've said this before, but I feel one way we're going to be able to take care of my guys is through creating a very profitable business that we can, you know, that's when I'll turn into Bernie Sanders and redistribute the wealth, I think. And, and, uh, 
Uh, what what kind of impact did Shake Shack have on that? Um, I think I was amazing. What Danny's done is unbelievable, right? And uh, he's he's been a huge advocate for his employees as well, and he's been a model standard for for how to be excellent in this business. And when that happened, and I think that was part of like the whole Chipotle craze. Yeah. Um, and I don't think anyone will ever get there again like that, but um, it, we have so many employees right now. So for me, it was more like, how do we take care and how, how do we almost diversify what we're doing? Because I don't, I cannot predict what's going to happen in the future because the culinary industry is so it's so murky right now. I, I can't, yeah. I can't figure out what the hell's going on. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really tough to, to decipher. Um, you know, right now we have a big debate on no tipping. Um, I, I have a lot of thoughts on this. Yeah. I, I, I think it works for a certain kind of restaurant. And I think that you need to have models of hybrid systems below. And I think that if you have anything over 75 seats, I think it really works well. Anything under 75 seats, it doesn't. And you see, need to have a certain my, amount of, uh, I don't know, comfort, which no one has ever proclaimed us to have in our restaurants, except for maybe Co. Um, so I, I speak to other chefs that have gone the no tipping, and we all know it's something we have to explore. And I think we have one restaurant right now that is really testing that out for the other restaurants. And I feel really good that I'm able to pay almost everyone, no, everyone on the back of the house $15 an hour. Um, our servers get paid a lot. I think that everyone could make a little bit more if they were going to get tips. So it's cool that everyone wants to oblige. But uh, Sugarfish does that here. They do. Yeah, it's just check comes, you sign it, and you're you're done. I mean, as as somebody that worked in that industry, like I always thought it was unfair that I made more bartending and waiting tables than the chefs did, like by a, a lot, a lot, and, and it, it was out of whack for. So when I started cooking in New York, I got paid nine seventy five an hour. Yeah. And um, I don't think it's gone up that much for many cooks. Right. And everything else in New York City has gotten more expensive. You can always find another waiter. It's really hard, it's to, really find hard to find the cooks. right cooks. And there's, you know, it, it bothers me because a lot of these cooks are coming through culinary school with huge debt and they can't pay their bills. So yeah. it makes me really mad to understand the situation we're in right now. And... Uh, it's something that we're trying really hard. This is when I get super serious. <laughs> trying to figure out this No, shit. I think this is really interesting yeah. because like, all right, say there's a $200 bill and you say it's an 18% flat fee. So 18, so 36 bucks on that check basically. That would normally just go to the server. Right. You're saying you redistribute that so that the server maybe gets what, 13, 14%? Our servers still make more money than the cooks. Right. I you're couldn't even hire a servers that are making $15 an hour. You know, On average, they're making a minimum $30 an hour. At, and this is at Nishi. And um, I haven't figured it out. And we may abandon the tipping because it was never meant to be the restaurant it is. Um, I had an idea of culinary that we wanted to explore. Uh, but more specifically, we want to see if this model might work. Um, and I'd hate to abandon tipping or go to a hybrid model, but you know, we're about 60 seats. So if we had a hundred seats, I don't think it'd be an issue because there's economies of scale after, you know, uh, a big restaurant tour told me one day, he's like, why do you keep on opening these small, small restaurants, Dave? I was like, um, because I don't want a 300 seat restaurant necessarily. This is probably like 10 years ago. It's like a kitchen that serves 50 people is the same size as a kitchen that serves 300 people. But I feel that that discrepancy, you lose intimacy, yeah. you, you lose that that sort of feeling of being in the restaurant that you wanna be at. So well, I there's think- There's one other piece of that too though. If it's What's harder that? to get in, it makes people wanna get in. Yeah, that's And if you have a restaurant true. that passes a certain size, and it's not special to be in there, I really think there's this ice cream place in LA called Salt and Straw. And it's really interesting how they uh, how they did it. First of all, it's small. They put this giant table in the middle of it. So when you wait in, you have to kind of line up around this table. So it's almost impossible for them not to have a line that goes out the door. Right. And people see the line and they're like, oh, what's it's going human, on there? It's human, and it, it's it's human like, nature. It's so smart. <laughs> yeah. And the line is always out the door because they want the line to be out the door. 
But as I get older, we, we I feel like we, we got our master's or doctorate in that kind of uh, service style and momofugu. Yeah. And it's something we still employ at some of our restaurants. But as I get older, it's like, man, I don't want to fucking do that. I don't want people to wait in line like they do. So we take reservations now. And I think that I'm not, I'm not saying losing our edge, but it's like you can't. You can't do what I don't. I can't be like forty-five years old and playing or doing what I did when I was twenty-six. It just doesn't happen that way anymore. You know so. what Joe House does? He hires standers <laughs> to stand in a line so he can be properly fed. No, no reservation restaurant. That is something that is, um, you know, it's changed dining for sure. So, do you want how many minutes do you want to rain against American Chinese food? <laughs> no, I, I, I don't rant. We had a great meal at Yang Chow yesterday. I know Chen that you said you it. wouldn't love that place. I no, it's fine. You made Chen turn on Yang Chao. Not to sound racist, but it's probably going to come off as racist. This, it's oh yeah, it's always a it's great always qualifier. Great, great, not great to, to start off a statement that way, right? <laughs> um, I think L.A. and I joke this. I, I jokingly say this, and I did it on my friend's uh, Great Debates podcast. But it's like L.A. is divided, I think, in white people food and then everything else. Right. And to me, it's. You know, Yang Chow is this weird it's, purgatory. It's a tweener. <laughs> yeah, it's like Draymond it's Green. It is like Draymond Green. And you I'm can not, go off the menu at Yang Chow. Yeah, it's it was delicious. There's nothing that was not delicious about it. But if I'm in LA next time, it's like, man, I could go to the San Gabriel Valley or I could just go to Koreatown. Yeah. And get something that was like way more unique. Unique, yeah. But the slippery shrimp was slippery unique. shrimp was delicious. I mean, that is an amazing dish. We, well, we got three. We, truth be told, last night we had three dinners. <laughs> Just so you could sample. Well, Peter and had never been to of a never been to Philippe's French dip. Yep. Which, while delicious, what I love about it is the total like fuck you attitude of the restaurant, which yep. is like my dream. It's great. Oh, I love that. I love it so much. You're lucky to be here. <laughs> yeah, it's like you wait in line. Like it makes no sense in terms of how the service flows. And, yeah. It feels like a very New York place. And then we went to Yang Chow because I wanted to see if it was that good. Okay. Because Chris thinks you say it's your favorite restaurant, Chinese restaurant. Yeah. I mean, I don't have a ton of. I know. Because well, now I it makes drive sense. 45, 50 minutes yeah, to go to But it makes sense the... now because you like five guys. Makes sense. Oh, man. That yeah. hurt. Yeah. Uh, that I, hurt. I, I, get it. I get it now, you know. That's fine. I see. I told you I'm not always right. <laughs> no, they're both delicious. I, so we had Yang Chow after that. And then we had a massive meal at Otium. So Timothy Hollingsworth, a uh, new restaurant. So um, I'm going to hurt your feelings time. even more than this about how bad my opinions are on food. I like P.F. Chang's. Hey, I like P.F. Chang's too. I was in Austin once with Dave Jacoby. We went for South by Southwest, my old Grantland buddy. We were there the first day. We were like, all the barbecue we're going to eat for four days. We leave our hotel. We're walking down the street. We see a P.F. Chang's. And we just looked at each other. And we're like, we ended up at a bar at P.F. Chang's in Austin. You got lettuce wraps, wraps, didn't you? Which one? You got lettuce wraps? What do you, what's your order at P.F. Chang's? I, I get a bunch of stuff. I love the lettuce wraps. I, dude, I go so far back with General Gao. <laughs> I, I just love that dude. And I'm always getting it. I like that people are now going a little gluten-free with the General Gao. I, this is which which I don't feel like I'm consuming seven thousand calories. That it's done so like forty five hundred maybe. Slippery shrimp is not healthy for you. I'll tell oh, you. Oh, it's Yang Chao's terrible. I almost go into a diabetic coma <laughs> when I leave Yang Chao. It's so much sugar. But that to me is what's interesting. Like what PF Chang does, or even Panda Express. Like I think there there's um, room for someone to do it better. And it's not a challenge to what else is out there, but. To I me, agree. what's more exciting, going back to the eight to thirteen dollar range, um, and I, you know, why I wonder sometimes, am I doing this to convince myself? Because creatively, it's like, no, do I... it. Whatever you're thinking, do it. Do it. Do I think it it's just LA. more exciting to to make uh, things that are for the masses right now. Yeah, because it's well, in you a can weird way, change that way. So you can affect change, but in a weird way, it's a different kind of challenge, right? It's it's almost like the difference. When you're a writer, you can take a whole bunch of paths, right? You can write um, magazine features really well thought out. You can write columns. You can write blog posts. You can go all kinds of different directions. The hardest thing to do and the, the thing that I always love to, the, the biggest challenge for me that I really wanted was how can I write something that can appeal to the most possible people while also being good? Mm. 
That's and so that's hard. kind of what you're talking about. And that's I always look at like Star Wars. I hadn't I'm so excited for stuff that is like makes as many people as happy as possible. And right. that's where I'm culinary speaking, that's where I'm at right now. Um making food that everyone wants, that is delicious. Um and for a long time I thought we were making food that everyone would love, but the reality is we were only making it for a select few still. So Uber's been good for you, I'm guessing. Uber, yeah. Throw I'm, a couple like, a couple extra drinks on the end of the tab. Well, I think that Uber's changed LA more than any city that I've been to. Oh my to. god. Oh my people get drunk. Turn it into turn it everyone yeah, alcoholics. I, mean, I think that's the resurgence of LA in terms of dining it has to be attributed to somewhat to Uber for sure. No question. So I just talked about this with uh I think it was with Chris. People Saka. get wasted. Well, because before it was like you had to do the coin flip. It was like, are you driving or am I driving? And then you couldn't get, you know, too hammered because then you have your sober spouse like just hating you. Yeah. Now it's just like, let's go. Let's yeah, go. Let's go to LA, dinner. LA has definitely benefited more from Uber than any other town that I've been in. So have the uh, the um, obstetricians because I think there's been a lot of mistake kids the last few years is my theory. <laughs> Uber's created a lot of mistake kids. Uh, a lot of twelve thirty a.m. I shouldn't have had that seventh cocktail, kids. Yeah, man. they're all being born. Do we cover everything, Chen? You happy with that? You sure? Golf. Which one? Oh, golf. Why the fuck do we want to talk about golf? Oh, he wanted me to ask. He's what mad that you retired from golf. A You're jerk. a champion golfer, and you you quit golf. Oh my god. You couldn't handle it. it I same reason I, I, I quit. I don't understand golf. like everything. It's like things get embellished. Like why? I was a very good golfer. Was I one of the best golfers in the country? No, that was Tiger Woods. <laughs> but you played Tiger was, Woods once. No, I tried to qualify. I was qualifying for the Big Eye in Houston, and that's when I dawned on me very quickly that I was like, "This guy's won it three years in a row, and he's a year older than me." And I was like, "This is never going to happen." And Chen said you guys went to a diner and picked up waitresses. That wasn't true. <laughs> <laughs> in Houston, no, I won a few tournaments when I was younger. Okay. Um, and I burned out like I, I, I had a breakdown at Robert Trent Jones when I was 13. I was trying to qualify for the U.S. Amateur. Hmm. I believe that I shot uh, a score that got me about three shots out. Top 10 made the, uh, the neck to basically you advanced. Yeah. And I think I shot like 136 the second 18. Wow. Yeah. I was crying. Yeah. <laughs> It was really bad. Plus, like my caddy never showed up, so I was carrying my own clubs. And Robert Trent Jones arguably might be the longest golf course from hole to hole in the mm. world. So, and it was like a hundred ten degree d degree day in Virginia. So. I was gonna say maybe temper. I still remember it, right? Maybe your temper issues weren't like the greatest thing for golf, or or it would have been great if you would become a golfer and you were throwing clubs on CBS. That would have been awesome. Last time I played golf, full eighteen was two thousand two, two thousand three in Dunebeg in Ireland and I threw my clubs into the ocean. True story. You just broke Chen's heart. <laughs> Cause like, no man, like everyone's, everyone tries to get me to play golf. Everyone. Mario Batali plays golf all the time. He's like, dude, Chang, let's play, let's play. And no, I'd rather go fly fishing. Are you more chef or businessman right now? Probably 50, businessman, 50, 50, 50, but you know, it changes like every month. It's just different, you know? But like my days of working the line every day and expediting, you know, no. Because how, ma how many times a year you just you have friends over at your house or whatever? And you're like, I'm gonna cook you guys something. I did that last Sunday. You did? What'd you make? I got engaged, by the way. Oh, congratulations! Thank you. Um, Sign up. She's prenup. an amazing girl. Congratulations, <laughs> prenup. Congratulations. That's great, prenup. <laughs> oh Lord. Um, <laughs> And I've been cooking more, so yeah, I cook pho. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. There's a place in Beverly Hills called 9021 Pho. Yeah. And it's Absolutely. my favorite name of any restaurant. It's, a, it's, it's just a, so it's, brilliant. It's, it's Every a, time I drive by, I just want to stop and congratulate them for what a brilliant name I, that I is. Can't, I can't. I don't know. Maybe the food's more delicious than the name. I can't back it. So you have poor choice in names and, and burgers. And poor Chinese, choice in and burgers. Chinese food. Poor choice in American Chinese food. <laughs> And unfortunately, I back your sports teams. So I, I have good I'm, taste I'm in sports teams. That worked out great. I was man, in oh, early on Lindsay. Wait, when are you getting back? When, oh, man. By the way, can I just. I love sports. Yeah. And one of the highlights of my life, and yeah. now a 38 year old man, was in Jeremy Lin when Sanity was happening in New York. I don't know if people understand. 
what it's like to be a fan of the NBA and to have, and Chris is going to be so upset because he's the guy that helps bring all these guys into the NBA. Well, like, for he's Chen, it was the greatest moment of his life. Yeah. The, he's that the was one his that guy. Was, he was the chosen one. Yeah. He was the chosen one. It was Asian sports fan Palooza. People were high-fiving each other in the street. People were watching all the games. It was the best. It was like one of the great four-week <sighs> random stretches that's ever happened. I went to a couple happened. games at the Garden. Like I've never seen it like that. And my God, it all ended terribly. And Is uh, that Carmelo's fault? Motherfucker. Carmelo loves five guys. <laughs> um, no, Lynn made a little comeback this year, though. Michael Rappaport was crushing his man bun on my podcast yesterday. He's very upset about that. And he was like, I f- look, I fuck with Jeremy Lin. I love that guy, but the man bun's got to go. It was, it was hilarious. Oh. I like that it, the hairstyle thing became his new gimmick for this year. Man, I, I, that's my dream. I tell Chris all the time to scour China and find a 6'6 wingman that more or less is Michael Jordan. And I will sell everything and buy Winnebago and go to every game. <laughs> so six six Asian Michael Jordan yes is your dream your sports dream oh, that is for new owner for the Redskins or six foot six Asian Michael I Jordan I will take the six six Michael Jordan really yeah because like my buddy David Cho the crazy yeah. Facebook artist guy we actually have debates about how awful it was growing up as an Asian American in America because we have no Asian role models right our only Asian role model was Bruce Lee and how realistic is that. That's way I never thought about that. Like, think about it. Michael Chang won the French Open, but it's like, dude, he's five foot six. <laughs> right. He did have that one. What was the one when he had the cramps and he kept? Yeah, he was like that, doing that the was underhand French serves. He, he, yeah, I love he, that. That was awesome. Right. That was and great. I can root for that. These are moments, but it's like more exceptions to the rule. You know, we didn't have comedians. You don't have any movie stars. It's never been ed- better to be like an Asian person today. But um, for like from a pop culture slash sports hero standpoint. Uh, like who, 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 you know, yeah, I love Len Cicada when he was on the Orioles, but like oh no one knows God, who Len Cicada. You to drop a Len Cicada <laughs> Yeah, damn, damn That's right really, I will. I didn't realize it was this bleak. <laughs> Very bleak. <laughs> Jesus. Right? So you have some Asian hockey players, right? But no one ever knows who they are. You obviously have some major, major, um, major league baseball players. Chan Ho Park, friend of Chris Chan's as well. Hilarious. How? By the way, you should, do you know the Chan Ho Park stories? <laughs> one day... Off the record, you should find okay. out what they are because they're arguably some of the funniest stories I've ever heard in my what life. What about when Y.E. Yang took it right to Tiger? No, because where is he now? But the, in the moment, no, that didn't no, count? No, no, no. We need someone that can sustain success over a series of years and just crush it. Yes. That is very important to me, and I need that to happen. And in the nba everyone would say like yeah but like yeah was a glandular fleek freak like he was seven 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 six you had a uh, wang wang who was it zizi well wang, wang? Yi lan was the big loss yeah because that one actually seemed like he had potential and it just well, wrong he, he team did. wrong situation I, I think he could have been good on the right team maybe not or maybe no. not i mean he was just posting up chairs and but got the six pick in the there's draft so many chinese people why yeah. can't they produce well, I thought, see, I thought the big hope was Yao married some, how tall is Yao's wife, Chen? Like 6'6"? Six, six? And that's the hope. They're Korean players, but they're like 7'3", seven, 7'4". Seven, and this is my big problem. I don't want, I don't, while wow, that's fantastic, I need someone that's more normal size to show their athletic prowess. Did you ever see that Nike um, commercial with Georgetown? Remember that one? Where it's uh, Georgetown versus UNC and... Uh, the UNC player is a Chinese guy. So the best commercial I've ever seen. No. There's a story that Chris told me why he sort of got taken off the air. I don't know if the West Coast ever saw it. I don't remember that one. It's the best commercial ever. For me. Maybe not for you. But. Uh, well, insanity. Maybe it'll happen again. I so you so. you drank it. Asian Michael Jordan won. Lynn Sanity Red, was selling to people ask me when's the last time I was happy. I genuinely will probably tell them almost always <laughs> Lynn Sanity. <laughs> I mean, I'm not joking. That was like for two weeks. It was like the best. Uh, anything to plug before we go? Um, shit. Always. We got the new Lucky Peach issue coming out. Okay. And uh, it's dedicated to pho. Um, we got Nishi. We got milk bars. We got all sorts of stuff, but, um, 
Is there a one-stop shop where my listeners could go look at your website and just, just Mom- go to Lucky Peach? Momofuku.com or LuckyPeach.com. My listeners can't spell Momofuku. <laughs> M-O-M-O-F-U-K-U. Tell there people, you, you know what's hilarious? Tell people on uh, when you're telling someone, an operator, like what's your email address? And I'll say like, blah, 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 at M-O-M-O-F-U-K-U. <laughs> They're always like, what the fuck is this kid's problem? What did he just say? Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. This was fun. I'm glad we Bill, finally got to do this. So we've been talking about it for a long time. Yes. I'm really, really lucky to be here. So thanks for having me. Thanks to Casper for sponsoring today's episode. If you want an awesome mattress that costs less than the other mattresses and gets delivered right to your house and is risk-free for 100 days, and if you don't love it, they'll pick it up and refund you everything, I would try Casper. And if you listen to this podcast, casper.com slash BS, promo code BS, and you get $50 off a mattress purchase. Thanks to Casper. And also thanks again to 5-4 Clothing for the jacket I'm going to wear tonight and also for sponsoring today's episode. $60 a month high-end clothing membership that will provide you with stylish clothes. Go to 54club.com. Use promo code BS. Sign up 50% off your first package. That is $120 worth of clothing for $30 for your first month's package. And don't forget, uh, we are spinning off the watch and we are spinning off keeping, keeping it 1600 off the Channel 33 podcast feed next week. And don't forget about After the Thrones, episode three on HBO Now, late, late, late Sunday night. Enjoy the weekend. Anytime y'all want to see me again, rewind this track right here. Close your eyes. Picture me rolling.